On today's episode of My Big Break Almost, we are going on the other side of the camera to a writer, producer, director, creator of one of the biggest shows ever on television, mm -hmm. Lee Aronson. He's done a couple of blockbusters that almost everybody here has at least heard of. Most likely you've watched a lot of. Yes. Uh, my favorite is Big Bang Theory, which of course we've already, you know, on one of the characters we've already interviewed. So I'm excited. That's right. Brian Thomas Smith was on. He was amazing. And now we get to find out the behind the scenes mm -hmm. of the show. And he didn't stop there. Lee Aronson also not only directed, produced, but he created Two and a Half Men. Yeah, Charlie Sheen. That's right. Charlie Sheen. Yes. And Ducky. <laughs> I love that character. And actually, but like that's the, not, yeah, Ducky is not the character in Two and a Half Men. No, uh, John Cryer. Yes. But I like the theme song. I got to ask him about that. Yeah, it'll be fun. So stick with us. We'll be right back after this. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Oh, I'm having a bad hair day, folks. Yay. Oh, it's okay. I have those all the time. Yeah. Do you want us to wait until you can spruce yourself up? <laughs> you look fabulous. Yeah, I'm good. I'm where's good. your wife? She can. Pardon me? <laughs> so where's your wife? She can just, you know, fix you up. Where's my wife? Uh, good How question. Um, what wife? <laughs> Single? Uh, getting there. <laughs> yeah. Getting there. Okay. What? Yeah, she's got a lot of single friends. I've got some friends. <laughs> Look out. You do. <laughs> let's, let, let's talk about a casual date before we talk prenups, okay? Uh, okay. <laughs> Those are now in there, though, right? A prenup is just yeah. ever getting. Oh, even... there's, there's no doubt. Okay. Yeah. Smart man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fool good. me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, your lawyers go to college. And yeah. Their kids go to college and their grandkids go to college. Oh, that's so funny. Hey, thanks so much for taking the time. And uh, again, I know you're looking forward to a spunky co-host rather than me, but you still get to talk to me as well, or you have to okay. talk. Okay. Well, I guess that's just the burden I'll have to bear. <laughs> that's right. He's the entertainment, though, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm not just good looks, Lee. So mm -hmm. it's it's amazing. Well, that's now, good. You don't want to coast on your looks. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Take it from me, coasting on your looks, just, it's it's very unsatisfying at the end of the day. I've found. <laughs> Great, yeah. Very, very good words to live by. So we are with such a multi-talented man, Lee Aronson, writer, producer, composer, whatever you want to be, you've oh. done comedian if we go all the way back yeah. that's true that's yes true. i but thought not not major league baseball player and not astronaut and not rock star so so those may be phase two of your career yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's what i was aiming for what i hit was comedy writing <laughs> that's right so let's start off with one of you know we're going to start off with a bang and maybe not Big Bang Theory. We'll come to that one in a moment. <laughs> but first with Two and a Half Men, and then we're going to circle back a little bit to how you got there. But Two and a Half Men, you co-created such an amazing show. Did you ever have any idea that it was going to take off and do the run that it's done? No, to the contrary. At the time, Chuck and I wrote uh, the Two and a Half Men pilot. Chuck had a 13 episode on a air commitment for a show to star Tyler Perry. So we figured that was what we were going to be working on, you know, for the following year. The, uh, the two and a half men script was just a script deal. And it was really something that was meant to just keep my writer's guild insurance in force. Oh my goodness. So how did it come about to where all of a sudden it came from that to, Hey, we may have something here or they may want to sign us to something. Well, uh, Tyler Perry backed out of the Tyler Perry show and we got in a room with Charlie Sheen and pitched him uh, the two and a half men idea because Chuck and I were talking and said, OK, uh, who would be the perfect Charlie? You know, not we wasn't named Charlie, but who would be the perfect guy? 
for this role of the, you know, the, the debauched brother. And we said, Charlie Sheen, you know, would be typecasting. And so we managed to get in a room with Charlie Sheen and we pitched him the idea and he wouldn't commit, but he said he was very interested. And so we wrote the script with Charlie's voice, sent him the script and Charlie attached himself to it. And once Charlie attached himself to it, it became a go pilot. Wow. And then we cast John Cryer and the rest, you know, the rest of the wonderful people in our cast. And, and we had the right script with the right cast on the right network in the right season. Cause, uh, uh, everybody loves Raymond was in its last two seasons there. And CBS was looking desperately for something that, you know, might be able to replace it and everything they put in the post Raymond time slot on Monday nights at nine 30 was not working. So we came along at just the right time. How did you get or think of John Cryer as being the brother? It's not that we thought of John Cryer as being the brother. He was uh, he was actually somebody that CBS didn't want. And, and they didn't want to hear about John Cryer because John had been in a number of sitcoms in the previous years that had failed. And so, you know, with the wonderful intelligence of network executives, they figured uh, John Cryer is a show killer. But we had him in to read and he knocked it out of the park with Charlie. And so we brought him in to read for Les Moonves and, you know, the other CBS development people. And they couldn't deny that John was the guy. And that's how we got him. Yeah. It's, it's so funny you mentioned that because when she was asking that, I was internally thinking, we don't exchange questions. I was thinking the genius of this was John Cryer, in my opinion, casting him because I never would have expected him to be the brother. And to me, that just set everything off uh, well, in motion. What I think of is he's kind of it's the stigma of Urkel to me. You know, John Cryer, in my mind, is always ducky <laughs> in Pretty uh-huh. in Pink. And yeah. that's it. So in a way, it's kind of a stigma towards, you know, just n- him never really having anything more than like how, what Steve Urkel tried to, I get you it. know, accomplish. But Delicious. now he's Lex Luthor. And he's <laughs> fantastic. You know, he would well. believe he was an evil, malevolent, you know, super genius. And he's none of those things. No. Just shows how good he is. Yeah. Now, as for the uh, actors that you brought in other than John Cryer, can you talk about what you guys were looking at other actors or did you fixate on him and say, we're going to bull, bulldoze? No, we, we had a number of people in. I can't, I can't remember specifically any of them, but you know, everybody in that, all, all the actors in that age range that were available and, and interested, we certainly read a lot of people. Um, but like I said, John just was head and shoulders above all of them. So did you put together the theme music for Two and a Half Men? Is that your creation? Well, it's a that's a interesting story. Um, I have two kids of my own, two sons. Um, at the time, my younger son was about the same age as uh, the boy in the pilot. And when my sons were young, we used to march around my house singing we are men we are men we are manly men we are men 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 so that was in my head and so when chuck and i are starting talking about you know should we have a theme song what theme song should we have i said you know why don't we try and find something like that we are men we are men we are manly men and i thought i had heard something like that i thought something like that existed i thought i'd heard it in monty python or something like that. And he said, yeah, find it. And so I went and I Googled and I Googled, you know, and I asked around, and couldn't find anything. So I went to my friend Grant Geisman, who's a fantastically talented musician, and said, uh, can, you put, can you put a tune to this? And he came up with men, 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 manly men. <laughs> and uh, we brought that to Chuck. And Chuck added the men, 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 manly men, men, men at the beginning. Wow. And that was history. That's incredible because that's a well thought out. It is. It's not like not happy thought out at all. <laughs> it's simple enough, but you remember it. That's true. I was singing it in my head because I did read that you. Wrote yes. It. Yeah. And I was like, 
is there any other word than man in there? <laughs> that would be manly. my re manly. Manly, that's right. Yeah. Manly and men. <laughs> that's the genius of it all. Yeah. Perfect. I mean, really, has, has any songwriter ever been paid so much per word or any writer <laughs> in the history of the English language? I don't think so. Maybe the guy who wrote Wipeout. That is only one word. Or, yes. Yeah, or tequila. Maybe yeah, that's tequila. It. <laughs> that's so funny. I need to quit whatever I'm doing and start well, writing. That's right. Just one word, Bazinga, and just yeah. the song, yeah. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and use that as the excuse uh, to go into Big Bang Theory. So how does it work as far as, um, you know, I know with Two and a Half Men, you know, you wrote, uh, you would also uh, uh, produce, I guess, uh, throughout the year as well. Is that right? Or is that just one episode you would produce? No, 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 no. I was an executive producer on the show, what they call a showrunner, uh, along with Chuck on Two and a Half Men. Um, and we were involved in the production of all the episodes. I was, I would direct one. Direct, that's season. it, okay. Yeah. So why only one? Like one per season? Yeah. Well, because my writing is a lot harder than directing, and uh, it was much more necessary for me to be in the writer's room uh, during the day than it was for me. You know, I was much less useful. Anybody could, almost any, we could put any director down there during the day. Um, so we had to wait until late in the season where, when we had all our scripts written to free me up to be able to spend a week down on the stage directing. Wow, and do you, do you like that? Is that something that you wanna do more of and less writing? Oh, uh, well, I'm not doing any writing and I'm not really doing any directing. I'm kind of retired. So uh, if I had to choose something to do, if you put a gun to my head, it would be directing because writing is hard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, every, everybody, everybody thinks they can write, you know, but everybody can, in fact, direct. It's okay. not it's not rocket science, at least. Multi -role. I mean, I think most women are born to direct. <laughs> she directs me all the time. <laughs> well, you know. If you, if you if you like telling people what to do, which I do, and certainly both my wives did, uh, <laughs> or what you're doing wrong, not necessarily what you're doing. You yeah, know, everything doing what you're doing wrong. I call it negative directing. Yeah. I get that all the time. So how how crazy is it uh, on the show? Once you have a script, is there a constant rewrites and adjustments, or hey, this is it, and we're just going to go with it? No, it's a constant. It's a constant rewriting process. I mean, we take a script, we do a table reading, and then we do a rewrite, and then we have a run through the next day, and then we have a rewrite, and then we have a run through the next day, and then we have a rewrite, and then we put it up in front of an audience, and then if something doesn't work in front of the audience, we'll stop the cameras, and you know, try and fix it, and then do the scene again. So we're, you know, we're constantly polishing and honing. Wow, I never would have thought of an audience. Just, I mean, that, that's kind of like striking to not get the response that you want. Yeah, it's kind of scary when you got something that, you know, everybody laughed at it at the table. Everybody laughed at it run through. Everybody laughed at it second run through. You put it on for the audience, you know, and it's, it's crickets. <laughs> that's, that's scary. You guys had so many uh, guest stars, mostly attractive women on Two and a Half Men. Yeah. Uh, just, again, stroke of genius. But did you? It was a different time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Did you all, uh, for any of the guest stars, did you all have any say so on who would, that would be? Or did you just leave that up to the casting agent and you would just write the part at Oh, random? no, 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 no. No, we cast. We cast the show. We would oh, have casting we, sessions for each episode and cast all the guest actors. Oh, my gosh. No wonder. You, how, uh, do you ever add up how many hours a week you probably put into that show? <laughs> Uh, well, there was a point in which I was executive producing both Two and a Half Men and Big Bang Theory. And that was like, you know, that was really much like getting on a hamster wheel. And it, you just don't get off until the end of the week. And then you go home and you collapse for two days. Wow. Goodness. Now, <laughs> was there a, I mean, I know the shows are both comedies. Uh, and actually, I've watched both of them continuously. 
But is there a drastic difference for you when you're producing one and having to go to Big Bang Theory for the other? Or are there enough similarities that you just switch, you know, chairs? Well, it's the same job on, you know, on both shows, but, uh, you know, different characters, different tone. Uh, So it's really like going from reading one book on your nightstand to picking up a book that's on the other nightstand and getting back into that story. You know, my, my assistant, the, the two shows were shot on adjoining sound stages right next to each other on the Warner Brothers lot. And so I'd get in a golf cart, my assistant would drive me to a point right between the two stages and I'd have to ask him, where am I going? <laughs> <laughs> because it was really hard to keep track, but then you say, oh, you're going to Big Bang. Okay, hop out and I go to my right. If he says, you're going to two and a half men, I go to my left. But as soon as you walk in, you know, you're, you're in the, the flow and the energy of that particular show. I mean, Chuck, Chuck does, at one point, Chuck was doing four shows at the same time. Oh, my goodness. Now, for the actors and actresses that you work with on both of those shows, uh, and I'm not going to say, hey, pick your favorite, because I know you can't do that, but was there anybody that you just looked forward to writing a line saying, I can't wait for this person to deliver it, because I just always enjoy how they bring their character across, especially? Oh, well, there, there were a number of them, uh, you know, in terms of, you know uh, uh, the character of Rose um, Melanie Linsky on Two and a Half Men you know she would always hit it out of the park I love uh, Berta you know uh-huh. would always hit it out of the park um, Jim Parsons you knew that whatever you gave him he was going you know he was going to run with it um, Jane Lynch who played uh, Charlie's therapist was also somebody who was a joy to write for because you, you knew that she would just take it and, and stomp it. Growing up, one of my favorite shows every Saturday night, I had to watch Love Boat. <laughs> that was my show. And they had different celebrities on every week. And I have heard how you came about to become a writer on that. But because I, I, you know, like a good stalker, I've done my due diligence. But I would love to have you tell us how you became. Uh, how you went out to California and became a writer on, again, such a classic show like La Boat. Mm-hmm. You probably mentioned this like 20 times. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Hey. Well, before I came out here, I grew up in New York, but I was living in Nebraska after college because I'd met a girl in college who was from Nebraska. And so, yeah, we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska. I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska with her, opened up a used record and comic book store. And uh, sounded like Big Bang Theory. Penny's from Nebraska, the comic book <laughs> store. Go ahead. I'm sorry to see queen. the similarities. Yes. Yes. Uh, and then she graduated from college and she dumped me. So there I am in Lincoln, Nebraska with no girlfriend, right? There's no reason to be in Lincoln, Nebraska when you're 25 <laughs> with no girlfriend. Uh, so I came out for the first time with a, a friend of mine from Lincoln and We were only going to stay out here for a week, but I stayed and he went back. I ended up selling my store and staying out here and uh, doing stand-up. I was uh, hanging out at the comedy store and the improv. And, uh, you know, the big shots, this was 1977. And the people at the comedy store that were the big shots at the comedy store, but nobody outside the comedy store had ever heard of, were David Letterman and Jay Leno and Robin Williams and Richard Lewis, you know, people like that. So it it was very obvious I was not going to get my own sitcom anytime soon. And I needed to find a way to earn a living, you know, put some food in my mouth. And like virtually everybody else who comes to L.A., I came with a list of people that anybody I knew knew that had any connection to show business, you know, mostly friends of my parents, my family. And uh, one guy on the list was a guy named Ben Jolson, whose brother did my father's car insurance in New York. And uh, Ben was gracious and nice enough to uh, have me to lunch at 20th Century Fox. He and his partner, Art Bear, had just started working as writers on a show 
that was new at the time called The Love Boat. And um, he came to see me do stand-up. And afterwards he said, uh, yeah, you're pretty funny. Have you ever considered writing? And I said, no, you know, and I hate writing. <laughs> Writing's like having a, a term paper every day of your life. And then he told me what they were paying writers on Love Boat. And I said, you know, on the other hand, <laughs> it might be worth looking into. And he sent me some scripts and he said, you know, come try and come up with some stories. And I, I would call him a couple of times a week and pitch stories to him. And I finally came up with a story that he thought was good. And he said, OK, write a scene. And I didn't even have a typewriter. So I wrote out a, a he sent me some scripts so I could see the form. And I wrote out a, a, a scene, you know, what would be the first scene of the story where somebody comes on board on the whatever it was, the promenade deck or walks into the lobby. And, you know, I took it up to his house and he, he flips through it, you know, and he says, yeah, you can write. So uh, then he brought me into the producer, Lynn Farr, and we pitched the story and she bought it. And I got the assignment. I got an assignment to write a segment for Love Boat. And I thought it was, you know, just some huge joke, some huge mistake. But I did it, you know, because I needed the money and uh, handed it in. And they liked it. And they immediately gave me another episode to write based on somebody else's story. And I wrote that. And they liked that. And then they gave me another one. And the third one that they gave me was uh, the first episode that featured the character of the girl who would be revealed as the captain's bastard daughter, Vicky. <laughs> That's big. <laughs> she wasn't, she, it wasn't planned that Vicky would become a regular, but uh, the episode came out really well. It's like a real tearjerker, and there, there was nice chemistry between her and Gavin. And... Uh, then they put me on staff, and so now I'm, I've got my own little bungalow on the 20th Century Fox lot, and that's, wow. you know, I still, you know, is expecting some large man to come knock on the door, tell me that a mistake had been made, throw me out of show business. <laughs> Did you feel like you were kind of, in a way, being pulled away from stand-up? I mean, is, oh, is absolutely. That... Uh, well, yeah. it wasn't so, I was being pulled, like... it's that, you know, it was, it was... <laughs> It was nobody was pulling me towards stand up and <laughs> <laughs> the money was pulling me away from it, you know, so it really was a no brainer. Right. So did you get to meet all of the uh, celebrities that were on Love Boat that you were writing for? For the two seasons that I was there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What an experience, because that was just a, a turnstile of celebrities. Of the yeah, day. well, we, we got people on their way up. And we got him on the way down. You know, we got Mark Harmon before he was the sexiest man alive. We got Ethel Merman. We got, you know, we got Ray Bulger. We got, you know, we got uh, Donna Mills before Knott's Landing. Um, so, like after you were done with all of that, did you did you have a lull in the middle of your next project, or were you just kind of like lost? Well, kids. Here's the reason you don't do drugs. <laughs> um, I, I was making a lot of money at a really young age and I went kind of nuts. And so I basically retired to party for a few years. Um, a few it was, years. wasn't the smartest thing I ever did. Um, and it almost killed me. In the but, hospital? Mm, I, well, if you count rehab, which was in a hospital, yeah. Okay. Um, and I got sober in 1983. And I didn't get a regular writing job again until 1988, which was Charles in Charge. Wow. And that's another show that, again, I loved watching Charles in Charge. So... So I'm just wondering if he was on, were you on scraps at that point? I mean, as far as like making a lot of money, being so young and then kind of stretching it out for that many years. Yeah, well, luckily, <laughs> luckily I, uh, I got residuals. I, I wrote a lot of Love Boat segments and I got residuals for them and they were rerunning all the time. They were rerunning in daytime on ABC, which meant I got 100% of my original salary every wow. time it reran on the network. Goodness. Um, 
so I, I, I managed to, you know. Oh yeah, stock up. Survive. <laughs> Good for you. So you, you kind of got back on the horse again with Charles in charge, mm -hmm. uh, writing again. And then I've seen, you know, so many shows that you've written, you know, Murphy Brown you even went and wrote, you know, CSI and Sybil. Now, when they have you write either for a season or a show, are you just coming up with an idea? And they're saying, hey, give us an idea for a script or they're saying, hey, would you come in? We just want to borrow you for a while. Well, it depends. Um, sometimes if, you know, for like uh, wrote a few episodes of Who's the Boss? And that was just a freelance thing where you'd go in and you pitch a story and if they liked it they they give you the assignment you write the script and then you go home uh other shows they hire you on staff like murphy brown i was on staff so i was there for the you know the whole year and i would write my own scripts but we would we would come up with stories in the room among all of us then we'd all go home write our scripts bring them back and then as a group rewrite them and and then other shows I'd just be a consultant on. Uh, I'd just, I'd come in a couple of days a week, go to run through, help with the rewrite, and then go home. Mm. Well, how many people would, I guess, collaborate and write a script and then, you know, come back? Um, it depends. That be you know, it depends. I'm Murphy Brown. We had one, two, three, four, five, six. I think six writers um, on Two and a Half Men, we didn't go off to write scripts. We, we wrote, we gang wrote all our scripts um, in the room. And the writing staff was eight people to 10 people, I think. Wow. Were there any writers that you worked with that became, I know the, the office will use a lot of writers that become actors and actresses. Were there any mm -hmm. that you worked with those writers that switched to on screen? No, not that I recall. I mean, they, we, we, like Mark Roberts was a stand-up comic and an actor uh, on Two and a Half Men and then went on to uh, create Mike and Molly, but he didn't go back to acting. <laughs> Seems like there's a, you know, a little key here on... Yeah, you don't go back. Go behind the scenes. <laughs> That's right. We're Especially still getting residual. Yeah, oh, like exactly. That That's the smart, smart <laughs> idea. Were there any uh, that you pitched that you really felt passionate that was kind of like your big break almost that, hey, I wrote this or I pitched this, I really believed in it and it just didn't happen or I just missed out on this one? Oh, boy. So many. <laughs> <laughs> we won't make you relive all that pain. <laughs> um, well, the first show that I, I created that I got on the air was the show called Life and Stuff. And it starred Pam Dauber and a stand-up comic named Rick Reynolds. And at the time, Rick was like the flavor of the month. He had done a one-man show called Only the Truth is Funny. It became a Showtime special. He was very hot. Everybody wanted to be in business with him. And so they put together a showcase for him where they invited a lot of writers writer producers who had overall deals of which I was one. And I really related to his comedy, met with him. So he chose me to develop with him. And we came up with a show based on his life and partially mine because we were both having marital problems at the time. And um, we actually got a mid season order and it just it just ran right off a cliff this show <laughs> i'm very proud of the pilot um but could yeah, you revamp it, it do you think that no. there's any kind of no 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 that's that's it's just one of those things i mean cbs owns it anyway you know because they produced it okay all right i didn't know if whether or not you know when people write scripts and they were kind of dumped that maybe you could revive one that well you can if you can if it's not produced okay if, if, you know i have a lot of unproduced scripts uh if anybody wants them uh, <laughs> but according to the writers guild you know after four years uh you get you get not an exclusive right but you share the right with the network to make a series to exploit the script um okay. so you know, I've got I've got some just ready to go. Just give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> They're like in the trunk. Paperwork. Hey, we have a camera. Yeah, yeah. we got it. Yeah. Hey, got a budget? I'm there. 
you lost us at budget. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so speaking of making something, uh, the magic music movie, uh, was that a labor of love? How did that come about? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I like magic it certainly Mike. wasn't a labor of profit. They kept their clothes on for this one, oh, I think. Okay. It's not yeah. quite like Magic Mike. I heard magic <laughs> and thought it was Mike. Um, that was definitely a labor of love. Um, it's probably the thing I'm proudest of in my you know, entire career. Um, the way it came about was after I stepped away from television, I was really looking at, okay, well, what am I going to do with my life now? Um, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to go get a job, but I don't want to just, you know, sit at home, you know, binge watching TV. I mean, you can only do that for so long. Um, and I found that the amount of time you can do that is about four days a week. You can sit home <laughs> and binge watch. Um, but, you know, it's what, what, what are you going to do for the other three is the question. And floating around in my mind was this music that I had heard when I was in college uh, by a band called Magic Music. They were a bunch of hippies. They used to come down. Uh, I lived in Boulder, Colorado. I was going to the University of Colorado. And these guys would come down and sit on the lawn and set up and play this beautiful acoustic music. And they sang wonderful harmonies. And they were original songs. And I just loved them. And they just disappeared. You know, they just disappeared uh, at some point when I was in college. Never saw them again. Never heard of them again. Uh, they never made a record, put out a record. Uh, never knew what happened to them. But I always wondered. And I, I, I kept hearing these songs in my head. I'd sing them to my kid. I'd sing some of them to my kids when they were babies, you know. And but I always thought, well, why don't I find out what happened to these guys? And that became a documentary. Was it easy for you to actually find them? Mm, well, it, once I once I got in contact with one, it became easier to get in contact with the others. Where did you start? I'm just curious because when you just I'm visualizing everything that you said and them being, you know, on their own. It's if you didn't know them, you just hear the melodies. It's almost kind right. of like yeah. knocking on all the doors <laughs> saying, "Are you the person? Are you the person?" <laughs> well, yeah. The way my first breakthrough was, you know, I would Google magic music, right? And, and I would come up with a bunch of ma magicians and singing, <laughs> singing magicians. And then I... <laughs> oh, I mean, that took forever to get through those magicians. Oh, uh, but then I thought to Google magic music Boulder. And I came across an article that was written about a guy named Chris Daniels in Colorado who has a band called Chris Daniels and the Kings, uh, you know, very successful regional band. And in one little paragraph of the article, it was mentioning some of the bands that he'd been in earlier. And one of them was magic music. So I scrounged around, I found an email address for him and I emailed him and said, you know, were you in magic music? And he goes, yeah. Uh, you know, I was spoons in magic music. And <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't remember any of the names, but, uh, you know, I, I actually, this, I had reached out probably before I actually got the idea to actually do the movie. It was just when I was trying to find out what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we kept in touch. And at one point I emailed him and I said, uh, how would you guys feel about having a documentary made and I didn't hear back from him and then I realized he had no reason at all to take me seriously I was just this guy on the internet <laughs> who was you know so I wrote him back and I said yeah I realize I haven't given you any, any reason to take me seriously um, you know here's my IMD pa IMBD page and then I heard back from him immediately and um, you know he was very into it and he talked to some of the other guys that he was in touch with, and they were into it. And, you know, so then we were on our way. Wow. That's kind of cool. I mean, that's really, because I would think the same thing, though. I'd be like, uh, no, delete. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's incredible to go that far back, that much footage you had to go through, and piece it together for a labor of love that you're actually able to produce now and send out to the world. 
probably. Yeah. Well, it is it is on Amazon Prime. If you're a Prime member, you can watch it for free. It's called 40 Years in the Making, the Magic Music Movie. Oh, well, we're, we're going to watch it now. Yeah, definitely everybody you should check that out. a picture for me, and now I just want to know. I want to see spoons, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Along with pork. <laughs> That's right. Those are the great No, they, had, they all had nicknames. There was Spoons, <laughs> there was Flatbush, there was Doss, there was CW, there was Toad. There oh, was... Okay. Do, you, do they go through the, uh, I guess, you asking them how they even got their names or is that? I did ask them, but I didn't, uh, there's, I think there's only a couple of them that are explained in the movie because okay. it just, if you don't know them, you know, that's just their names. Yeah. <laughs> that is wonderful. Got it. So now you're sitting here talking to us, which we're very happy for, uh, mm-hmm. other than this being one, I'm sure the highlights of your retirement, uh-huh. yeah. what is, <laughs> what is next that you've maybe daydreamed about that you might want to do? Well, I've really, honestly, there's not a lot on my bucket list. I've, I've done almost everything that I've, I really wanted to do in my life. There's some things I'd like to do again, um, but this time without the drugs. But, <laughs> <laughs> so you can remember it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, teach a, I teach a comedy class periodically. I just started one, uh, a new six-week class where I, you know, work with young actors performers or writer performers and uh you know we do things the way that we do them in sitcoms which is develop ideas um write them gang write them put them on their feet you know and then if it's good enough we shoot it as a short film where do you where do you teach that class um in north hollywood uh there's a there's a website for uh it's the website is thehumorresources.com. Um, I don't have anything to do with the organization of it okay. uh, or the details. I just show up. <laughs> <laughs> so you say you shoot it as a short film. Do you all post those uh, short films anywhere? Um, I, I usually in previous classes, I've just not posted them myself, but the people who work on them and appear on them are free to post them if they want. Wow. Okay. And so what in or other than the reels, pardon yeah. me? Other than teaching, I mean, is there anything else that, you know, you're, you're giving back to the community as far as your, your, <laughs> not picking your up wisdom? trash on the side of the highway, but your <laughs> no, knowledge. <it's> wisdom, yeah. <laughs> um, you haven't you know, yet. I, I, I mentor friend, you know, people, I, I, read scripts i give advice but i'm not going to read your script so don't ask thank you uh i don't mean you specifically i mean you oh, everybody yeah. in the audience um, yeah sure we'll send you the email yeah everybody just send your scripts yes. to lee right. personal right. cell number at the bottom right. then go to spam directly <laughs> no um i i just basically am, am living my life and and taking the time to enjoy it for the first time now, are your kids involved in in anything that you have been involved in, even though you're retired? Uh, no, both. I have two grown sons, and they're one is in law school and one is a lawyer. Wow. And two sons, no rehab. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> Congratulations. Golf clap. <laughs> yeah. And I have an 11 year old daughter who uh, wants to be an artist. Aw. Wonderful. Well, eleven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good till she turns about thirteen, then you'll yeah. know nothing anymore. Yeah, it's getting there. You can see the teenager walking down the road towards mm-hmm. you. You know, she's getting yeah. closer and closer, and I'm getting more scared, and more scared. <laughs> Just tie her up. Yeah, it is. Lock her in her room. Be afraid. Yes, uh, we've been there, so I get it. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us, taking your time. And because, again, it's valuable if you get to enjoy your time now to share your your thoughts and your experiences with us and all of our listeners. We really appreciate your time. Well, my pleasure. So We, we can't wait if uh, you decide that there's anything special you want to do again. Let us know. Another we documentary. Ha- That's right. On podcasters. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you find you find the person to finance it. Because <laughs> my, my business manager, I, before I made the film, I said to my business manager, can I afford to do this? Because I didn't want to ask anybody else for money. I didn't want to have to answer to anybody else. He said, you can you can do one. 
<laughs> one. And that was my one. So any more that I do, somebody else is going to be financing. Wonderful. Well, we can't wait to see what the surprise happens next and what you end up doing next that you're oh. not even planning for. You never know. You never That's know. Right. That's right. Lee Aronson, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a privilege having you on our show. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's incredible, though, that he was trying to work with Tyler Perry, and that didn't happen. So that was a my big break almost, and this was so much better as far as success-wise yeah. that took off. I mean, every, it seemed like all the dominoes fell in place for him. Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, that's great. He can retire at a really at a young age. For retirement, it is, yes. And he's retired <laughs> I don't know twice. know how old he is. <laughs> he retired he's retired twice. from marriage, too. Yes. <laughs> for a while. So he's getting a break from all of mm -hmm. it, uh, but it was it was neat just to get to talk to somebody who wrote one of my favorite shows growing up, Love Boat, mm -hmm. and then still one of my favorite shows, Big Bang Theory. It's neat getting behind the scenes and you know trying to understand how it all comes together. That's that's true because it takes more of a I guess a serious tone, even though it's a comedy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a business. Yeah. And now we get a chance to kind of see a little bit behind the scenes of what it takes to actually make that business funny for people to enjoy. It's, it's, it's a lot of information. It's it really is. overload. And I, could you imagine doing that for a living? It no. takes a special person to really do that. Yeah. I guess it just depends on the involvement. Mm -hmm. And he was heavily involved mm -hmm. <laughs> in both shows. That's incredible to have that kind of stamina uh, and success. And now he gets to hopefully enjoy the ride in the sunset as long as he wants. So I hope you guys enjoyed uh, learning something a little new because we did. It was different for us to learn uh, the behind the scenes and can't wait for next week's episode. And I hope you guys stick around on my big break almost.